privilege to introduce one of our keynote speakers this, af this are we afternoon, no, we're not quite afternoon, we're still in the morning, um, Professor Pete Gore, and as you've heard already this morning, we've been working uh, in partnership with uh, Professor Gore over the last wee while, looking at the life curve and how it could be applicable in the context of our active and independent living programme. Uh, Professor Gore works in the Newcastle University Centre for Ageing and his profile is in the pack, so I'm not going to read that out to you. Um, and with no further ado, over to you, Pete. And I'll, I'll try and see if we can get a little bit of uh, time back as well. Um, so let's just do a whistle-stop tour of ageing and the life curve. Um, so that's me. Um, you know about me. Um, I had to do this bit. Um, so this is the university. So you see this little uh, um, yellow circle. That's the National Centre for Aging, which that's called number seven on there. Number six, I think it is, is the National Innovation Centre for Data. So that's where we'll be and do course right next to data. And there's a really good uh, good message in there. But um, it just the, one of the reasons for putting this up there it just shows you Treasury thinking, UK government thinking that actually the, it's not just about bad stuff. It's not just about saving costs. There actually are opportunities. Um, we, can, we can do a lot if we get this right. Um, and I, th I think that's exciting, but also I, I should just put up because they pay me to be years. So. Um, so what could the future look like? Um, and this is just my vision of the future, but I'll show you why I think it's possible. Um, so if, if only social mo motivation, um, this is the kind of stuff that we hear in the news, isn't it? Um, caring crisis, um, we need more money, um, good luck with that. I don't know anybody in government that's planning to give you more money, but you know, keep trying. CQC, you know, we're at a tipping point. These are the kinds of messages. What, why are these messages really important? Um, so here's the Telegraph about a year ago. 40%, um, it's interesting they call that almost half. It's not, it's anyway. 40% um, of people um, are depressed in residential care. So what could we do about that? Well, we could do two things. We should provide better care for people. We should make that better. But we could also put less people in care or, or avoid the need for more care, and that would be another way of, uh, of solving that. Um, but hang on to that thought about depression. Um, honestly, this really was called the Barnet Graph of Doom. It's not my term. But you know, this is what people look at. They say, here are our costs, they're going up, adult services, children's services, here's our income. We go bust by 2022 or something. And that's the kind of di dialogue, particularly down south, we have with some people, um, which is pretty awful, isn't it? And, and, and that's, you know, we, we hear about the grey tsunami and all of these terrible messages. Um, and, and, and those messages are actually very important, and I'll show you why. So I want to present a different message because I don't think it does need to look like that. Um, so here's a little bit of a clue. Um, if you look at the green line, I think it is, the number of people going into residential care hasn't essentially changed. And in fact, the median stay in residential care hasn't exactly changed. But here's a place in Scotland. So the median stay is, um, is the green line. Um, the blue line is based on following 6,100 people um, over the system over these years. And I was looking and analysing how long they spent in residential care. And if you go back to the 1990 Care Act, the median stay, that's half more, half less, was 130 months. That's a staggering. That's nearly 11 years people used to spend, on average, in care, uh, residential care. Um, but not here. So actually, um, just put up some labels on there for you. So um, in this particular area of Scotland, they're down to 18 months, and statistically that's still falling. So what does that mean? So um, in, uh, if you look at the little blip, you see the little blip in there? Um, when we did this analysis, I wouldn't tell the managers what it looked like until I could ask them some questions. And said, what happened in 2006? And they thought about it, and they came back, and they said, we ran out of Don Care budget. We go, right. What happens in 2007? They said, we move some dom care, some rest care budget into dom care. And look what happened. So they didn't spend any less. They just spent it on rest care instead of dom care. So people going into residential homes instead of living where they prefer to live. Um, so um, we think this is quite exciting because if you look at, so this is the cost 
and it's just based on sort of UK averages, so you'd have to work out your own numbers. But the cost of 27.6 months, uh, on average in the UK, according to PSSRU data, is about 38,000. If it's 20, if it's uh, 18 months, it's 25,000. Now, you don't save 13,000 because it costs you about 4,000 to keep people independent in the community, but you do save 9,000. So, if you could get 6,000 of your folk to save 9,000 pounds, you just got a budget boost, didn't you? That's a whole load of money because it, you, know, it's, you don't need more money to do that. So I think this is exciting. I think there's some real opportunities. And academically, and I checked this with a colleague very recently because it does sound really outrageous, he believes that the average, the median stay, I have to use statistical terms, sorry, in stay insist, the median stay in res care could be as little as two to four months. Well, then we wouldn't need so many, but actually we could use some of those savings so that we'd have, we could have really nice places for sort of end-of-life care. But that's what we'll be talking about, places where we go in for a few months, two or three months, four months maybe, and then, uh, and then we die. So now we can have really, really good quality care, but actually we're just using money that we were spending anyway. And that means people spend more time in the community, which I know has its challenges, but it's where most of us would choose to be. Um, so there is money in the system, and I think we can do that, but how do you do that? You do that by um, doing the right things for people at every stage of the process. You can't just wait until they're about to go into rest care and go, how do we keep them out? It's too late by then. Um, so we've got to do it. Just to put it in Scotland context, again, they're really crude numbers, but if everybody in Scotland um, had a median stay of 18 instead of 27.6 months, you'd save 500 million. So they're worth having these numbers, aren't they? I think we'd all be happy to have those kind of numbers. So, and let's, this is the imagery we hear, we see this in the papers, I think I cut this out of the paper. Um, this is the kind of stuff, so it's all negative stereotypes. I would love to be able to bend like that. We believe she was about 90 when she did that. Um, I, I will never be able to bend like that. She's just stretched, stretching the end of a run. And actually, you know, um, we're seeing some interesting... The truth is, if she's still smoking that 100, she's probably not going to change her life expectancy. Who cares? But, but there's an interesting attitude thing coming out here, which is really important. Uh, meet Charles Augusta. Um, so... He said when he got to 85, he had a crisis. Okay, so what health issue happened to him when he was 85? He said, I looked in the mirror and I was fat and out of condition. And I thought, I need to do something about that. Why? He said, you know, I'm not chasing usefulness. I just want to be healthy. So he, he trains in the gym. He's 97 now. I think he's doing all right. Um, I'd be quite happy to look like that at 97. I should be quite happy to look like that in my 50s. So, uh, um, and, and have started to go down the gym deliberately to try to kind of regulate yeah. them. Not quite there yet, just in case you wondered. And I love this. You know, we, 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 we talk about our services and all the rest of it, but um, she says, I just want to get on with my masters. I don't want to sit there talking to social services. Well, it's fair enough. You know, these are the lives, ordinary people. They, they, they just want to get on with them. So how do we help them? Um, so whatever we think ageing might look like, we're actually probably wrong. And here's an example. So this is 4,200 so-called senior Olympians. So these are fit people. Um, but their fitness age, measured in, a, in an evidential way, and if you want to do your own, you can go on here, um, is 25 years younger than their chronological age. I'm 12 years younger at the moment, so I'm working on it. Um, but it's not, it, it, it's, it's just 40 questions or thereabouts that you answer and it helps you look and understand how you're changing your fitness age. And who doesn't want to be a 50 year old when they're 80 or something? Um, so we're starting to see these sort of different attitudes um, and maybe some clues. So what do the public think? Well, they start to say things like, uh, well, there's nothing that you can do about aging, is it really? Well, actually that's wrong. It's about 25% genetic about 75% about the choices that you can and do make. If you, if you come from a more deprived area, it's harder to make good choices. So we need to try to kind of stack things in their favor. Um, uh, but you can still make good choices. I don't want to grow old. Well, the alternative's not great. Um, uh, but actually, it's not like the past. So um, 
uh, I'm supposed to talk for 45 minutes. So life expectancy will go up um, nine minutes during my talk, and not because of me. In fact, it might go down because of me. Um, it goes up five hours a day. That's 12 minutes an hour. So if you wonder where all these older people are coming from, that's because we're living longer, not necessarily better for longer. And in fact, the downside is that we aren't living better for longer. We're, we're, we're living longer, but our, our healthy life expectancy is not going up at the same rate. So that's what we've got to do something about. Um, I want to stay at home, I don't want to go into care. Well, you probably don't have to go into care if you make the right decisions at the right time. And we, we're here, I, I've worked with allied healthcare professionals in very close relationship for about 15 years. I love what you guys do. I know the difference that you can make. Um, we, need to, we need to change this for people. I know we can change this for people. So here's some facts about aging, just, just to try and get it in context. So we do talk about comorbidity in health. Um, we talk about frailty, um, we talk about disability. Um, actually, they are, we would argue, some of us would argue academically, they are different concepts. So they do interact. So somebody who's more frail, the problem with frailty is that it isn't something that the public understands. So we, can, we think we can measure it medically, but it doesn't mean diddly squat to you know, somebody you're having a discussion with. Um, I don't use the term disability, I call it age-related decline, only because the pattern of decline with age um, will happen anyway, whether you get a health condition or you don't. Um, uh, health conditions interact with it, um, but it's a, it's a process, an ageing process uh, in and of its own right, so um, just to draw the distinction between uh, general disability. Um, cancer, uh, cardiovascular disease and neurodegeneration, uh, the single Im most important risk factor is age. Interestingly, um, with uh, um, neurodegeneration, the, ins the, I have to get this right, the prevalence of Alzheimer's has gone down 1.8% over 20 years. The incident, the number of people, is going up because we've got more older people, but the prevalence is going down. But actually, one of the really exciting things about... Um, so how many people believe they can grow their brain as they age? You really can. So actually, the more you use your brain, if you do the right things, actually what you do is you protect yourself against, you still get damage, but you give yourself more capacity to respond. It's a bit like you know, going down the gym and building your strength. That means that when you're faced with a challenging situation, you're more likely not to kind of um, fall over or whatever, whatever things. And aging is incredibly malleable. And I'll show you how incredibly malleable it is, hopefully. Um, so there's our 29 hour day and I know we often focus on the health conditions that people have got but actually they just want to get on with their lives actually they, they're really bothered about the things that they can't do some people like going shopping I don't understand that but some people like to go shopping so we need to help them do that so um, how do we build a framework um, for evidence so I, I, I was challenged about 10 years ago just over 10 years ago um, to build a framework for understanding the role of technology in aging. The problem was we could never label the y-axis. So we drew this, we did a big, ex big conference in uh, SAGE in Newcastle, and we had, we, we got age slash time on the horizontal, we all got that, and then we got something that we should be able to measure on the y-axis, and we couldn't, and we didn't really know how to, and, and, and in fact, what really sort of tipped this over and started this uh, framework, um, I'll, uh, I'll show you now. So if you go back, you know, we all understand, I'm guessing most people understand these. Um, uh, they're not the only problems that people have, um, but there are um, uh, these 15 markers, we've got really good evidence. And the problem in this area is that you need huge data sets over extended periods. So we don't do some analysis with a... Um, the data set of three age cohorts of women, it's only women in Australia, um, there's 40,000 people in that that they've been following for 15 years. Um, but imagine the cost of that study. So that's one of the reasons we don't have all the evidence that we got. But if you can't do these things, you can't live independently. So if you can't feed yourself, you won't be able to live independently. You will either be getting full-time care or you'll be uh, in full-time care. Um, so let's 
go back to the beginning. So um, Gutman um, founded the Paralympics, and he was trying to kind of categorize disability. Sidney Katz started coming up with these activities of daily living definitions. Walter and Brody said there's some more complex ones, and more instrumental ones, like shopping requires more than just the physical ability to um, it needs money as well. Um, uh, and then, uh, and we've always done scales, but the uh, Groningen Activity Restriction Scale is one that's widely accepted and developed, obviously, in the Netherlands. Um, so we count the deficits that people have. Um, and then uh, I came across, so, so we, I was on a project where we were arguing, the whole load of businesses in the room, and we were all arguing, saying, um, these, are, you know, these should just be consumer products, these are really consumers. And then the next business would say, no, they're not. They're medical products. We could kill people if we get this wrong. And I sat in the middle going, well, I don't know that we could kill people. So how could we look at the same people and come to different conclusions? Um, and so I saw Carol's work where she'd got some the prevalence of these problems in a population. So we've been studying people born in 1921. We've been following them since 2006. And actually, there's a prevalence. And I said, yeah, but that, wouldn't it be great if that's the order that they occurred in? And she said, it is. And you go, oh, wow. So then we plotted a, an order. And we suddenly discovered that the consumer guy was at the top of the hierarchy. The medical guy was at the bottom. And I was sat in the middle. And suddenly, we could understand why we were talking about different, not different people so much as people at different stages. Mm. So we, uh, um, so. She said, well, it doesn't look like that. It actually looks like this. So the first thing you can't do is cut your toenails. This is, there's a little bit where it gets slightly less um, statistically significant in the middle. But um, essentially, you know, this, is the, this is the order in which uh, people decline. The last thing you can't do is feed yourself. Um, uh, being a, uh, I don't know what, I'm a greedy academic or something, I said, yeah, but could we put time on that as well? Um, so then we came up with the idea of compression of functional decline. It's a horrible name, but I have to have an academic name. So, um, but life curve will do just fine. Um, so let's introduce Emily and Jack. Um, so Emily can't do those things. Jack can't do those things. Of course, I, I'm messing with you because I messed up the order. Actually, they did occur in the, the, the same order. Um, she hasn't been able to do those things for two years. He hasn't been able to do those things for eight years. Um, taking them eight years, um, why should we treat them differently? And when you look at the, the scores that people get, I can't tell why that we should treat them differently. Um, yet I know that Jack needs very different treatment to everyone. Um, so that's really what this framework is trying to help us understand. What should we do? So here we go. So if I put Emily and Jack on there, you can now see they've had very different journeys. So Emily is actually declining really rapidly. So we really need to get reablement, reactivation to Emily. We need to try and get her back. In the early stages, you can get back off this curve. But we certainly need to stabilize her and stop her declining further. What the theory suggests is that the longer you spend, eligibility is just, you don't measure eligibility this way. But it's a kind of rough, rough. So you, you intervene with people essentially when they hit that line, nominally. Um, the longer you spend in those higher areas, you don't really extend life expectancy. You do a little bit with some things. So what that means is that he will decline much more rapidly, even though he's at the same stage. So actually we need to have slightly more holistic thinking about him, because he is going to lose an ADL um, capability perhaps every one to three months or something, depending on what um, gradient he's on. Um, so here's some recent insight into aging. Just, uh, um, I wish I'd known this guy. He did actually talk about aging, believe it or not. He said, use it or lose it. Um, and it turns out he was right, even though that's two and a half thousand years ago. Um, so the question is, can we compress decline? Can we actually do that? Um, or do we just shift people so that they have better time now, but actually all we do is push out life expectancy? Um, so there's uh, my uh, friend, I wish he was, Hippocrates. Um, we've got the hierarchy, which we reconfirmed um, a little while ago in those 40,000 Australian women. Um, uh, in that same study, uh, they found that the onset of a disability was somewhere between 45 and 88. Well, nobody believes the 88-year-old got 43 years more life expectancy. 
um, that would make them a record. So, so that isn't true. So at the macro level, we certainly can compress. Um, we've found evidence here. So it turns out um, if you have simple little bits of technology, you will use 3.8 hours less care a week. Um, uh, a similar kind of, uh, this was a randomised controlled trial from a chap called Bill Mann, it was quite small, but what he showed was a similar kind of thing that you can reduce the care hours uh, significantly. He also showed that he did it in the VA system where they pick up the tap or everything, and what he showed was that the healthcare costs were reduced twice as much as the social work costs, um, which is encouraging for our uh, um, health partners. Um, uh, th this is an example of where we know we can change somebody at a particular point. So this was a very interesting study, um, eight, 1,700 people um, in a randomized control trial, eight centers across the US, and they found people that were just about to lose their ability to walk 400 yards. Um, so they split them into two groups. The intervention group were given um, group and personal exercises to do at home. The control group were given um, all the public health messages about how to age well. Um, the study was three years, so it takes a little while to get it going, and then you have to write it up. So we were able to follow them. They were able to follow them for 2.6 years. The people in the intervention group kept the ability 2.6 years longer than the control group, but it didn't change their mortality rates. So in other words, we stretched them out at that particular point up there, but we didn't stretch the x-axis. So they didn't live any longer. So that's 2.6 years. Now, it wasn't free to do exercises, but you know, the, the cost savings uh, are, are pretty dramatic. Down here, Emily Agree showed that actually if you put care and technology together, um, people tend to overcare. So you actually accelerate people's decline. So you're better to stick to the technology, or you've got to think about, and now we're getting the care industry saying, how do we do enabling care? And the challenge is, not to do something for someone that they can do. So if somebody struggles with cooking a meal, then cook it with them, not for them. And I know that needs a completely different rethink in terms of how we do things, but that keeps their ability for the longest. Um, and family carers over care too. You know, it's just a, how do we get that, that message out there? Um, yeah. uh, we've also looked at the last 12 months. Um, so actually you can tell there are patterns beginning to emerge. So somebody who has Alzheimer's will have quite a lot of ADL um, deficits over the whole of the last 12 months, um, whereas somebody with cancer will be the last three months and so on. So there's uh, all kinds of interesting things emerging there. And um, the best piece of research, so I don't know whether any of you have heard of James Fries and the compression of morbidity back in the 80s. Um, well, he gave up in about 2012 and said nobody can measure morbidity, so <laughs> we don't know whether we can press it or not. So he said, but we do know how to measure disability. So he looked at a group of people who had, um, in the data that was already being collected, and looked at people that had made different lifestyle choices, and discovered that if you made the right lifestyle choices, you would compress the period of disability over the course of your, your life. Um, so yes, we can compress. Um, so I think that's really exciting. If you want to read those, I'm sure you can get a copy of the slides. I won't bore you with them. Now, we talked about attitude and how people are starting to kick against that. So here's a staggering piece of research from the Irish. So this is the Irish uh, longitudinal study on ageing. Um, and what they found, and so they've been following a good group of people for quite a while, is that people who don't believe they can age well or don't believe they can change it will walk slower two years later and they will be more cognitively declined. So when we put these messages out about how, you know, the grey tsunami and how terrible it is and all the rest of it, we might just be cementing decline into our populations. And if nothing else, if you go back to the day job and um, encourage people to think about what they can do as they age and how they, can, um, how they can make the most of what they've got and change that attitude that's coming out in the press all the time, then you will improve their cognitive ability and you'll improve the speed at which they walk. And of course, what does that mean? They won't decline as fast and give them. So, staggering. Um, and they checked, um, so actually there is impact in health as well, but they also adjusted for all the uh, you know, things like mood and all that kind of stuff. Um, 
it's just staggering stuff. So the attitude, the, the, the things that we communicate to people are really, really important. Um, okay, so should we intervene in an order? And, uh, we'll okay. Okay. Um, so conceptual approach is um, here. So um, first of all, we build reserves. So actually, the, um, we reckon if, if we call them free range older people, um, so they're out in the community, and they have about 30% more capacity in their musculoskeletal system than they need to do their daily tasks. Um, so Simon Stevens, head of NHS England, says they lose 5% a day in hospital. So by day six, they went from an independent person to a dependent person. Um, so we fixed their medical problems, but we made them unable to live independent in the community. So how do we... So what's a really good example of how you take this on board so I, I saw this one person is somebody who was going to have a knee operation and the physio came to see her about three or four weeks before the op and said what do you struggle with and she said well there's a steep slope i have to go down for the boss and then i have to climb back up it and if i can't get to the bus stop i'm housebound so i'm really worried about not being and she said okay you need to walk that four times a day really yeah, you need to walk that four times a day. And you need to stand on one leg in the corner of the kitchen so that you won't fall over with the unit either side and stand on one leg each in turn for as long as you possibly can. Post-operatively, they signed her off two weeks later because actually she was fine. She got her ability back. And I've heard other stories like that. So that's just about building capacity. So we can do that uh, when we know people are going in problems. Then we need to reactivate, so people will lose the ability. If they live long enough, they will, uh, they'll decline. So how do we get that ability back? And, and we'll give some examples in a minute. Then we compensate. So the idea of this picture is simply, I can't give this person their right leg, lower right leg back, but I can give them the ability to walk with technology. So it's not the only role for technology, but it's one of them. Uh, and care, of course we need care, because people will lose the abilities but we don't need premature care because that accelerates people. So what, how, what do we mean about that? That's going to take some, uh, some defining. And of course, I've only talked about functional cognitive interacts with this. We just said if people don't believe they can change the way they age, they'll decline cognitively more. So um, risk, they, they have higher risk when they get further down. They have higher care needs. Um, so w what have we done now? When somebody likely to become a family carer, on average, probably for an older person, they're probably about 60 and they're probably female, um, about two thirds female carers. Uh, and what have we done to state retirement age? Moved it from 60 to 65. So now they do 50 hours care a week and then we wonder why they're falling apart. Um, so, you know, we, there's some challenges here for policy, aren't there? Um, connectedness. So, uh, let me be provocative. Social isolation doesn't matter. That get you listening. <laughs> so I was asked to write a book chapter on social isolation, the role of technology, and I discovered that social isolation doesn't matter. Your response to it is absolutely critical. So you can live in a family of eight and feel lonely, and you can live on your own and not, and that's what matters. And if you feel lonely, whatever your circumstances, that's as bad as smoking 15 cigarettes a day for your health, and it causes you to decline more rapidly. Um, so we really do need to understand that. I mean, I know that's not the kind of intervention we do, but we're starting to get GPs prescribing social connectedness and stuff. Health, there are obviously interactions with health and lots of opportunities there. And we just tend to think of those as risk factors for functional decline, because if we made a framework that had all of those in there, then nobody would understand the framework, and then we'd lose the value of it. So, um, I kind of tip my hat on this, really. Um, but people say, oh, we're going to do something for 75-year-olds. And I go, well, um, top, middle, or bottom? <laughs> because actually, there is no... I can find people at 100 who can still cut their toenails, and I can find people at, in fact, uh, yeah, at 65 who are down the bottom. So it's not an age, it's the stage. Of course, the older you are, the more likely you are to be down the bottom. So it's not that age doesn't matter. Um, but if we start thinking about... You know, um, you know, somebody said to me the other day, somebody who should have known better, he said, uh, I can't cut my toenails, I'm 63, what do you expect? And I said, I expect you to be able to cut your toenails. He said, I'm not saying I'm not fit. He said, I can run 10K. 
And I said, then your cardiorespiratory fitness is very good, but your flexibility is rubbish. Go fix it. <laughs> but that was his expectation. It's just, and we have to recalibrate that. Um, we love age because we can measure it really easily, but it's useless as a predictive tool. Um, not totally useless, but you get the point. So if you're not on the life curve, so most of you probably aren't, not all of you not on. So if you go back enough, you know, how many of us can run half a mile? How many can climb mountains and things like that? That's early mobility loss. So if you don't want to be on the life curve, then make sure you keep those abilities. Um, how have I responded to that? I know that you lose one to 2% of your muscle mass for every year you are over 50, and I'm over 50. So I now go down to the gym to reverse sarcopenia, and I'm fitter than I've ever been. Um, so that's what you can do. You know, everybody everybody in, in my company, everybody I know at the university that understands this has changed their behavior. And that's what, and we can model that, because then it's also a personal story to people when they go, well, what can you do? And you go, well, this is what I did. Um, so what could the future look like? So let's just do some interesting examples on the life curve, because what, what I want to encourage you to do is think about some of these for yourself. But let's give you an example here. Um, so we showed this to, um, believe it or not, a bunch of IT people. And you go, OK, what a... And, and they started taking their shoes and socks off to try and work out whether they could cut their toenails. <laughs> Imagine what that conference was like. Um, but the, the, the guy that went and took this, he's a model maker, so engineering model maker, and he went home and, and went down to his model club on, on a Saturday and looked at these guys and thought, middle-aged guys, overweight, don't exercise enough, what can we do? So he said, why don't we make model planes? And they said, oh brilliant, we've never made model planes, what a great idea. So they're all running up and down this field to fetch their crashed model planes back. What a brilliant way of getting people's mobility back. And they didn't even know that he'd manipulated them like that. Just brilliant. Just, um, another example. So uh, this was a head of service, actually, that, um, that um, we're starting to work with. And uh, his mum called him and said, when you next come, I want you to take me shopping. And he said, oh, fair enough. What for? And she said, oh, I need new footwear. Oh, why do you need new footwear? She said, I can't tie my, untie my shoelaces, tie my shoelaces anymore. And... So what would we do? We'd give them elasticated shoelaces. That's not what he did. He said, I tell you what, why don't you do some yoga classes? So we booked her yoga classes. So she doesn't need to change her footwear. Um, she hasn't spent any money on new footwear. He's a cheapskate. Yeah, he's a <laughs> cheapskate. <laughs> but actually, the shoes. He, he did. Yeah, so I, I, I didn't say she couldn't buy any shoes. But, but who wants Velcro shoes or elastic shoelaces? Yeah, so anyway, brilliant example. Never give up on people. So we do need to intervene earlier. For sure, that's a really good idea. But actually, thinking about enabling people happens anywhere. And I looked at some work that Thomas Gill did, and what he showed is that the earlier you catch people, the more impact you can have. And you go, kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I kind of get that. And then I found this study, a randomized control trial in a nursing home with the frailest, um, unfittest, however you want to describe it, people. Um, and they went in, and they split them into two groups, and they got therabands for one of the groups, and they started doing exercises. Their muscle mass increased 108% in eight weeks. Wow. And they said, and we observed improved stair climbing and gait. You know, so never give up. It's just incredible how the human body will respond. I've got in my back a theraband, four pounds. You know, it's, it's nothing. Um, we should give them away. Um, when people are struggling to get on and off chairs or seats, what we could do is get a higher seat. Or we could try and get them a higher seat for the moment and then slowly lower it, take the cushions off or other things, you know, do it safely, but slowly build that ability back up to go over 90, and then they won't need their raised toilet seat, which nobody really wants. Um, and they won't need a higher chair. Um, doesn't mean they can't have one, but they won't need one. So uh, another example here. Um, so, um, and I know Anne, and don't, so don't mishear me about falls. So it's really important we do great work in falls. Um, but the WHO says 70% of fallers don't admit they fall. 
Um, so we can't really intervene with people that don't admit they have a problem, or it's very, very difficult. So why can't we just think of that differently? So when you're up there, what's one of the abilities? So as you started to lose lower body capabilities, what will happen is you'll start to not be able to go out shopping. So if you still want to go out shopping, um, you'll need to do something to keep that ability, keep it safely. So why don't we go to the local um, shopping centre and say, do you know what, there's all of these older people, so believe it or not, 80% of the nation's wealth is in the over 50s. Um, so we want those to go out shopping. We want those folks to go out shopping, spending their money. We don't want them spending it on Amazon. We want them to spend it in the centre of Edinburgh or wherever you are. So why don't we go to shopping centres and say, we know how to keep older people shopping, spending money for you. We're not going to do that. We need you to do a keep you shopping course, which is Tai Chi, strength, and all of these kind of things that we know. So it's all about uh, balance, flexibility, strength, and endurance. So we know those things, but actually, people might just go on a keep you shopping course. Um, and actually, we didn't even have to pay for it. Um, so um, rocking feet. So um, we, we were asked years and years ago, we had a local um, rest care home, and they said, this lady's got um, a, um, a leg ulcer, and we just can't get rid of it. And the district nurses come in. And we, we, it doesn't matter what we do, it's just not going away. So we got her a little um, cushion that inflated on both sides so she could pump her leg slightly, and it healed. £8.50. Not a very expensive intervention. And you look at the cost of treating leg ulcers. I think for the NHS in England, it's something like £3 billion a year. <laughs> and, yet, and I'm not saying you can fix every leg ulcer. You know, don't, don't mishear me. But for some people, just improving the circulation of their lower legs might make that easier. And, and, um, and isn't a medical intervention. So we want to collect your ideas. We want to encourage that. So you'll notice my colleagues in the other room have got a massive life curve. And uh, we're encouraging you just to think of ideas. We did this uh, in an area of Scotland last Friday, actually. Just get your ideas and stick them on in different places. And then maybe we can start to communicate that back to people. But also think about your communities, because the, 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 the thing to remember is that more than 95% of the time, we're not in touch with people. So whatever we say to people, if they don't do it, if they don't self-manage their aging, we, we actually won't really make a difference because we're not with them most of the time. The same with chronic conditions. If the doctor doesn't create a habit of managing your chronic condition, then, then all they're doing is fixing your bad management of your chronic condition. Um, so we need to build that culture of, yes, you can make a difference and help people um, do that. Um, and here's my thing for the future. So in five, ten years' time, this is the uh, age bit band. I just mixed up some names. Just to, um, Who knows what it'll be called. What does it do? Well, um, I reckon with the right data, I can tell whether people are starting to decline. And maybe we can use that to sort of nudge people, actually need to go and see a physio because, you know, this sort of thing. Wouldn't it be great if we used, everybody's wearing fitness bands now. It's not stigmatising to wear a fitness band anymore. used to be. Um, you know, 69% um, you know, of these things that people wear around their necks to call for help are in the bedside cupboard. Honestly, they are. I know that because I know people who know. Um, and so if we can have things that people use and that they would use and then use that data, maybe we could trigger the activities, of the services, products, the consultations that people need off that real kind of measurement. So uh, this is my mission to create the age bit band and have everybody wearing them. Um, and with that, I'll say thank you. <laughs>